Tom, your MBT theory is the key not only to scientific advancement but to a more peaceful world. You have many supporters of MBT from very diverse backgrounds, from physics, science, uh, doctors, lawyers, truck drivers, different religions, Catholic, Jewish, Protestant, and they all recognize that MBT is a theory that includes everyone. A big toe, a theory of everything, must by definition explain all and include all. Um, no one needs to set aside their beliefs for yet another set of beliefs. You just ask that they keep open-minded, skeptical, and tolerant of others and come from love. Your science definition of love is low entropy, which involves some of the questions we have later on. Placing everything in a big picture, I think, is a step toward world peace. Our first question comes from a young adult of 14 from England, Lewis. Um, from many events in the news and everyday interactions in schools, he asks for a practical application. How can we best deal with those who confront us with their religious beliefs, racial and ethnic intolerance, and claims of superiority? Okay. I find that the best way to deal with uh, what I will call a true believer, you know, those people who are um, have very strong beliefs and they, they don't even see their beliefs as beliefs. They see their beliefs as the way it is, you know, the only one truth and so on. You know, this is what I would call a, you know, a true believer, somebody who is completely captured uh, by, their, by their beliefs. When you have that kind of a person and they are trying to proselytize, they're trying to uh, um, ascertain what your beliefs are, and if they're different than theirs, then they want to fix you because you're obviously broken because you don't have the right beliefs. Uh, when you have those sorts of people, the best thing to do is to be polite and try to extricate yourself from the situation you know, politely if you can. Oh, excuse me. You know, I hear my mother calling. I'm going to have to go someplace else. Whatever, you know. Now, you can be in a situation where it's hard to extricate yourself from people. Um, you know, maybe it's somebody in your family. Um, maybe, um, you know, you are, um, um, you know, waiting for a bus and... <laughs> This person's, you know, sitting in the seat next to you, you know, and, and uh, or standing next to you. And you can't just walk off because you'd miss your bus or you can't just get off the bus or move out of your seat because there you are. You're kind of stuck there. Well, in that case, just be polite. Um, show a little interest. You don't have to feign being interest. You can just kind of let it be known that you're not really very interested about it. And unless they get rude and pushy to where they are, um, you know, kind of cross that point where it's just, um, just ignoring them seems to work. Well, then you can ask them very politely to, you know, change the subject. Don't really want to talk about that. And, uh, or I'm not really interested in what you have to say about that. But I would say that's just about as strong as you need to get. Because if you try to push back, if you try to tell them that they're wrong, if you try to tell them that their idea of proselytizing and, and trying to change you and so on is wrongheaded and they shouldn't really be doing that and their beliefs don't make any sense anyway and so on, all you will do is throw you know, gasoline on that fire. It will just get much, much worse. So I think the best you can do in that situation is just try to get through it. You know, if politeness uh, and showing... Uh, you know, friendly but moderate disinterest isn't enough. If they don't take that hint, then asking them politely to change the subject or talk about something else because you really just don't want to talk about that with them. And then if it persists, I guess you could, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if you're stuck in a seat next to them. I don't know what you could do. Just ignore them, I guess. Pretend they're not there. Or you could go ask the attendant, if there is such an attendant, like a flight attendant, if you're on an airplane, that could she please find you another seat that the person you know sitting next to you won't leave you alone? That sort of thing. Um, you know, but you need not to get angry and you need not to try to teach them a lesson and so on, because that will always make it worse. That will escalate the problem. 
And you don't want to escalate the problem. You want to de-escalate it. So particularly if you're young and an adult has you cornered somewhere, you know, it's a little difficult because you feel uh, like it's hard to tell an adult that you really don't want to talk about that. You know, that seems uh, more difficult to do than if an adult to an adult. So I would say just show them that you're disinterested. If that doesn't work, then leave. Find some way to, to move. Get the stewardess to find you a new seat. Uh, um, you know, just leave them so that they can't do that. If they follow you, if you're out on the street and they're following you or whatever, well, find the nearest policeman and tell them that you're being stalked or something, you know, that this person won't leave you alone. And uh, please, could they just contain them for a while until you escape, you know, or that kind of thing. But mostly people won't take it that far. Typically, they are energized if they think they're making progress. In other words, if they think that they're going to convert you and fix you and get you looking, you know, get you going in the right direction, then they are energized to keep at it and to push. If they get the idea that it's absolutely useless and they're not going to do that and you're just not interested, they will tend to let it go. You know, most people don't want to waste their time either. But if they think they've got a convert, you know, coming, then there's hardly anything that will turn them off. So just be polite, but don't encourage them. Escape as soon as you can. You know, that's that's what I would uh, tell this young man. Okay. Um, it's tough for kids, especially in the school situation. It's a very delicate situation in some places. Um, would it be helpful to say something like, you know, I respect all of that and everything you're about, but there are seven billion people in this world. We all think and believe differently. Everything is is valuable. There are some uh, good things to all beliefs and cultural traditions. But if you're not coming from love and tolerance, I'm not interested in this conversation. Yes, you could say that. Uh, but if what you're trying to do is end the conversation, that will probably prolong it because then they will have something to come back from that. Well, of course, what they're talking about is love and peace and all that sort of stuff. And the only way to get that is by believing what I believe. You see, you're just, <laughs> yeah. going, to, you're just going to lengthen that, that conversation. Of course. You can do that, but uh, that, will, that will not cause them to go away. That will cause them to stay and push it further. And then right. once they push it further, you will probably regret that you did that because <laughs> you really want them just to leave you alone, you see. So I'd say of course. That, uh, if you want a conversation, if you think it would be interesting to have a conversation, then yes, something like that would be a perfect thing to say. You know, you can try to open their mind a little bit, but opening a true believer's mind is probably about one in 10,000. It's not likely to happen. And generally, you just like to escape as soon as possible rather than encourage more conversation. Of course, you're I know you. Going, yeah, you're not going to give them some logic and some, and some um, uh, rational thought and have them go, oh, I never looked at it like that before. Thank you. I've got a bigger picture now. You see, that won't happen. True believers won't ever do that. They're not rational. That's what being a believer means, you know. If you're rational, then you don't have beliefs. You just have open-minded skepticism. But if you're a believer, that means that you believe what you believe regardless of the facts. It doesn't matter what people say. It's the way it is. You cannot talk to an irrational person with rationality and expect them to respond to it. That's the problem with talking to true believers. They're not rational. And no rational argument, you can, uh, you know, you can pin them logically to the wall, but they won't accept it. They won't see it. It won't help them get a bigger picture. So I'd say try to refrain from proselytizing them. Try to refrain from, from uh, educating them and, and explaining to them the error of their ways and why they're not looking at it right, because that will just prolong the argument. Now, if this is a, if this is a real discussion, not a true believer trying to proselytize, then yes, you say those kinds of things. It's an interesting discussion. You should, you know, you should be able to uh, hold your own and say, uh, you know, what you think and why you think it, and and so on. And the other people should respond to you uh, rationally. But as soon as you realize that it's not a, a, a rational discussion, 
then it's just best to leave it alone. Okay, Tom. I, I know you've said before we we are each here on a, at our own level of of consciousness of quality, or and everyone has to work out things for themselves. So that's probably very good advice. I'll go on to the next question, and this question is from Elk on entropy reduction and intent. I'd like to ask Tom if he would go over some practical ways for us to reduce our entropy. I've listened to many hours of Tom's YouTube uh, videos and audiobooks, and I feel like I just need a simple list, uh, something less abstract, of things to focus on. Well, yeah, I do uh, less abstract. I do tend to be abstract because I tend to talk in general because everyone is different. And if you give somebody a general understanding, then they can take that, hopefully, and apply it to themselves. So every everyone needs a kind of a one-on-one -on -one for just specific applications. But let me say a few things that are that are maybe general but less uh, less abstract. And that is every day you make hundreds of choices. And the choices may be small, but particularly focus in on the choices of interaction with other people. Okay, that's that's where a lot of your more important choices are. How do you interact with other people? And that's your family, it's your wife or your children or your girlfriend or you know your teachers or the people you work with. It's everybody that that you interact with. Okay. How do you choose to interact with them? What do you, what do you feel? What do you think? What do you what do you say? And look at the intent behind it. What's the intention? And if you find it, it's not the action, really. It's not what they said, what you said. Uh, you know, it's not so much what happened. Is it is the intent that you have in that interaction? If that intent that you have in that interaction is all about you. How can you get them to do what you want? You know, how can you get them to see it your way? How can you get them to go along with the way you know is best? You know, if it's this sort of thing, it's all about you, then that is your ego. Now, another way of finding your ego is if it doesn't feel good, if in that interaction you feel upset, annoyed, angry, um, frustrated, any of those things, then any of the negative feelings, then that's your ego. Okay, so now once you find your ego, then you trace back to the fear. What's the fear driving the ego? So this is a practical thing that everybody can do. Everybody has relationships with people. Everybody interacts with people, even if it's only the bus driver when you get on and off the bus and have to put your token in the thing. You know, what do you say? Do you ignore him? and just get on the bus and drop your money? Or do you say, hello, bus driver? Hope you're having a nice day. Or, you know, do you growl at him? You know, I'm in a hurry, get his bus moving. You know, how do you deal with people? So it doesn't have to be just, you know, people very significant to your life. It's just how do you deal? What is your feelings and attitudes toward people that you interact with? That is the, I'd say that's the place to go look. Because what you're looking for is ego. That and the fact of whenever you feel negative feelings about anything, that's a feeling that's not happy. It's not joy. It's not pleasant. It's not pleasing. It's not the smiley kind of feeling. It's the frown kind of feeling. When you feel those, then look for the ego. And once you find the ego, look for the fear. And once you find the fear, you found your task. Get rid of it. So that would be what I'd say is on an every day that everybody can do, a hundred times a day, which means you have to be introspective. When you're looking for that fear, you can't just be talking to your ego because if you talk to your ego and say, hey, ego, what's my fear? Your ego are gonna say, you don't have any fear. Why do you think you have fear? You're perfect just the way you are. That's what your ego is going to tell you. So you have to have some, some introspection that really looks at why I feel this way, why I interact this way. Why do I feel uneasy? Why am I frustrated? Why am I, you know, upset? Why does this bother me? That kind of thing. Find out why. Dig back to a deep place and you'll find a fear. All fear is irrational. And 
you'll have to deal with that fear. How do you deal with the fear? It requires courage. You just have to say, I'm not going to, to act based on that fear anymore. And then you have to be aware when you do interact based on that fear, catch yourself and say, oh, close your mouth, you know, and uh, think a little bit about what you're doing and try again. So it's just a matter of policing yourself in that way of being aware of what you're saying, why you're saying it. And then over time, that'll get easier and easier. And eventually that fear will be gone. Then you pick another fear. So that's how you do it. One fear at a time. You work on them. And eventually it'll work out. Now, when you first try it, it will seem impossible because you'll keep doing it, even though you've noticed the fear and said, oh, yeah, I don't want to do this. You do it anyway. And it seems impossible to not do it because that's just the way you are. Well, you just have to keep working at it. It's harder at first, gets easier afterwards. So you have to really want to do it. If you're only doing it because you think you should, then you're really not going to get very far anyway. That's just your ego again. So if your ego is really what's trying to do this because it thinks that would be the thing that you ought to be doing, then it's not going to work very well. You have to be sincere in your effort to want to change yourself and grow up. So that's the, you know, that would be my description of kind of plain vanilla. What, what do you do on an everyday level to get rid of, to get rid of fear? And the hard part is to keep at it because it will seem impossible when you start. Thank you, Tom. That was uh, really well in illustrated, and I think that'll be helpful to a lot of people. His second question, and some of this you have touched on, what would an example of a good intent be if a desire to protect yourself isn't one? One thing I'm a bit confused about is the seeming incompatibility of acting out of love and acting out of self-interest. Can you not do things out of love for yourself? For example, eating healthy food or exercising or taking a course with the intention of looking after yourself or bettering yourself? Yeah, uh, you are, I, I'd say, uh, who is this from? You said um, Elk. This is from Elk from MBT. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, Elk, you're, you're a little uh, confused on this idea of um, what it is to be loving. Uh, you can protect yourself, okay? A good intent can protect itself. This is not a pacifist philosophy. Uh, matter of fact, there are times when you are obligated to not only protect yourself, but to protect others and do what you have to do to, to accomplish that. So this uh, philosophy isn't one of you can't protect yourself. And I'm not quite sure where you came to that conclusion but it hopefully wasn't anything I said. It's just maybe you jump to conclusions about peace and love shouldn't ever, you know, be violent. Therefore, you can't protect yourself. But this is not that sort of philosophy. Um, let's see, what was that? Um, acting out of self-interest. Okay, can't you eat healthy food or is that acting out of self-interest? It's not what you do that's important. It's not the oh, I ate healthy food and that was good for me. I'm a bad person. You know, that doesn't make any sense. You eat healthy food because it is good for you. That's why you would eat healthy food. And if your intent is, I'm going to eat all this healthy food so all the other people around here won't get any. You see, there's this table full of food and most of it's junk, but there's just this little bit over here that's healthy. And I'm going to go over and grab and eat all of that before anybody else can get any. Now you may be having ego that's pushing you to eat the healthy food. You see, that's the wrong reason. It's the intent. It's not whether you eat the food or not. It's basically intent. If you say, I want to eat this healthy food that's available for all of us, I choose it or I order it in the restaurant because that's better for me. I'm healthier. I can think straighter. Then that's a good thing. That's not being self-centered. That's just being intelligent. Sort of like the fear thing. Somebody will, some people will tell me, well, sure, there's rational fears. You know, if you're out in the woods and you see a bear, the rational thing to do is, you know, run or be afraid. It's a rational fear. And say, no, you, you have the wrong idea. You see, being, being uh, fearless doesn't mean being stupid. So, you know, if you see a bear and you're afraid and you run, 
Well, if it's a bear that eats meat and you run, you just designated yourself as prey. And that wasn't a very intelligent thing to do, but it's what your fear made you do. So the fear is really very irrational there because it's going to create a bigger problem for you. An animal that uh, eats meat, sees meat running away, chases it. You know, it's just a natural instinct to chase what runs. So that would be a foolish thing to do, not a, not a, um, a fearless thing to do. Now, if you are out in the woods and you're fearless and you see a bear, hopefully you were smart enough to know that there were bear in those woods and came prepared, which means you got some information. What do you do? Do you stare them in the eye? Do you never look at their eyes? Do you back away slowly? You know, do you pull out your pepper spray or your, or your uh, you know, big uh, horn that makes a lot of noise that you backpack just in this case? Or what do you do, you see? And then you do it smartly, not because you're driven by fear, but because you have information to raise your probability of survival, you see? The fear keeps you from thinking straight, makes you irrational. You do things that aren't to your survival. So there really is no rational, rational fear. Okay. So you eat healthy food for a good reason. That's because it keeps you healthy. There's nothing self-centered. That's that, about that. That's just being intelligent, like going into the woods with your pepper spray because there's bears in the woods. That's just an intelligent thing to do. So uh, you've misunderstood it a bit. Uh, if, if you're in a situation where there is negativity, um, uh, how should I say this, uh, being violent or beating up on innocence, then you have a, an obligation given the situation, you know, maybe you wouldn't, but in, in many situations, you have the obligation to step in, you see, and protect innocence. Now I'm sure you can come up with a hundred reasons, you know, why you could make up a scenario that that would be confusing and maybe wouldn't be the case. So don't take the things that I'm saying so literally that you apply them completely literally to every situation. You have to think, what's the intent here? What's the probability? If the probability is by acting violently or acting nonviolently, I'm going to lower the entropy of the system in doing so, then that's a good thing to do. Stopping that violent person from, you know, from what, stealing the candy from that baby or, you know, whatever it is they're doing, then that will raise the entropy. You've just taken low, uh, you know, high entropy and you've contained it. That's good. All right. So that may require some violence. If on the other hand, you see the baby and you'd want the candy, so you grab it because you're bigger, you see, then uh, that's not, that's not good. That violence is, uh, is absolutely high entropy violence. So we, we, we want to look at the intent and what the results are in terms of entropy and, and, uh, and love and caring. Are you making the, the world a more loving place or are you making it less so? So we need to not be, um, what shall I say, so black and white at every situation. We need to look at each situation by its, in, you know, in itself and decide what is, the, what is the way that love approaches the situation. Sometimes the answer is, well, love would be violent here. Love would be protective. Love would eat good food. <laughs> you know, that's, that's what love would do. And sometimes love would, you know, take, you know, turn the other cheek, um, you know, uh, not hit back, would uh, do those kinds of things because that's what would end up lowering entropy most. So it's not a one size fits all morality kind of kind of thing, you know, that you always act this way in this situation because situations are are physical. That that's the action. And the action does not determine morality. Morality is determined by intent. All right, Tom, the next question comes from Champion Deluxe. This is also from the MBT forum. And also on some of it is on the subject of lowering entropy as well. Um, first part of the question, when you access the past probable database and you're speaking with the past avatar, for example, Uncle Fred, and you're attempting to get data, do you create an avatar that is most expedient to get the data out of that past avatar? 
someone Uncle Fred used to trust? Or do you just access the data you need without even having a conversation with Uncle Fred? Do you just access it as you might with remote viewing? Spot certain coordinates? Is it a, a particular address, I think, as you're used to, to say? Okay. Um, first of all, no, you are not creating an avatar, you know, to talk to. You're, you are querying a database and you're getting information out of a database. That does not require an avatar. You are consciousness. You have access to the database. You're asking questions and having an interaction. And this interaction you're having is with the database. And this database is a probabilistic database. So if you ask Uncle Fred something or tell him something, then he will react to that question or that statement in the way that's most probable for Uncle Fred to have reacted. And we have this probability based on everything Uncle Fred thought, felt, said, you know, wanted to say, but didn't, you know, all of it, everything that's Uncle Fred, all of his experience produces this probability of what Uncle Fred would have done or said. And this is what you'll get. You're interacting with a probabilistic database that is modeling Uncle Fred. So that's that is the typical thing. Now, there is a possibility that if the conversation becomes real interesting, that the conversation becomes very significant to you, perhaps the larger consciousness system might step in and give you some information to help you out. Maybe it's something that Uncle Fred wouldn't have said, but it's something you really need to hear because it would help you a lot. Then the larger consciousness system may speak that through Fred's lips, so to speak. In other words, that message might come from your Uncle Fred, even though that's not really something Uncle Fred might have said. It's a, it's a message to you through Uncle Fred. Uncle Fred's now just the conduit from the larger consciousness system because that's something that's important for you, something you needed to hear. All right, so that can happen also. Now, most of the time, that's not what's happening. Most of the time, you are just... Um, accessing the database. That's typical. Special cases where special um, information needs to be passed, then that's where you would get the other, where you'd have the larger consciousness system using Uncle Fred as a conduit to get you information that you need, right? Because you believe what Uncle Fred says, or it has a certain context when Uncle Fred says it, that you accept the information more than if you got it from a stranger or a, you know, a burning bush or a you know, a talking bird or something that uh, works better if you get it from Uncle Fred. So Uncle Fred is the is the way you get it. So no, you're not creating avatars. You're just you're just talking to a database. The second part of the question. Uh, furthermore, considering the overall system is trying to lower entropy, the data you get from Uncle Fred would always come in some way uh, trying to lower your entropy. So the data you get is not necessarily the truth of the situation, unless the truth is expedient to your lower entropy. Is that okay. correct? Yeah, okay. We talked a little bit about that, just the last thing that I said. Yeah. Uh, it's not necessarily true that the system is always trying to lower entropy in everything that, that happens. The system has to just let stuff go as it goes. And you're accessing the, the database, you're querying it, you're asking questions, you're getting data. You're sending uh, questions to Uncle Fred. Uncle Fred's resp responding with probability. And that system just goes the way it is. You just get the truth of that situation until it's important for you to get something else. You say, if it's important for you to get a, another message through Uncle Fred, then the system can do that too. So it's really a mixture of both. That's why you should always remain open-minded and skeptical. So you get something, you, you have a connection with a database and you get some things. Well, there's a good chance that most of that is just the way you thought it was. It was Uncle Fred. But there's some probability that some of that was something else that was added for your benefit. Okay, or, yeah, well, for your benefit. So mostly you just get the truth of Uncle Fred because that's what you're doing. As long as you're talking to Uncle Fred and Uncle Fred's talking to you, then there's no need for it to be any different than it is. It's not like it gets filtered so that Uncle Fred can only say things to you that are things that would raise, you know, that would uh, lower your entropy. Uncle Fred will say whatever Uncle Fred would probably say. 
and you just have to deal with it unless it's a special case where a message is trying to get through to you. So it's not that it is true that you never know exactly where in, any information is coming from. And that's true when you're out of body as well, or, you know, doing anything else, um, uh, with your, with your intent, any information stream you get could have something else added to it. That is not exactly what you're thinking. Sometimes people who look up and see bright lights in the sky it's, and nobody else sees them, it's not that they're having a hallucination. Is that that bright light in the sky got added to their data stream. It's like, that's special for you, you see. It gets put in your data stream, but it doesn't get put in the other's data stream because there really is no bright light in the sky except in your sky that you see. Well, we all live in our own personal reality. And in your personal reality, there's a bright light in the sky because that's the data you're getting. Where'd that data come from? Well, that probably has a lesson for you in it. That bright light and what you make of it and what you do with it and so on is a, is a lesson that's going to give you opportunity to grow. So there's your bright light in the sky. No, you didn't just imagine it. It was there. Okay. Now, the problem here that we get into is, all right, the larger conscious system can put data in your data stream, whether it's Uncle Fred talking to you or bright light in the sky, whenever it wants, if it thinks that's going to lead you to some opportunity to, to uh, lower your entropy. Now, you probably need to be a person of interest to the larger consciousness system for them to be paying that close attention to what you see in your data stream. Those who are trying to learn, those who are awake and ready to learn will have these things happen. Those who aren't, aren't going to have that special case happen to them very often unless the system thinks, well, you know, if I just did this and they got this in their data stream, that might wake them up. Well, they may get a wake up call, but in general, Nobody's really paying attention to what they and their Uncle Fred are talking about because they're just not ready to grow up. So the, the, the probability of slipping in something else for them is not very high. In that case, they're mostly just going to get truth out of Uncle Fred or Uncle Fred being how he would probably be and nothing else. So you see, there's lots of different ways that reality can unfold. It's not just simple that, you know, it's not just simple black and white. Everything is either this way or that way. There's all kinds of ways that, that uh, things can happen to you. Information that you get. It's, it's not always like it seems. When you leave this reality and go to a, another virtual reality that isn't um, as tied down with a tight rule set as this one, all sorts of strange things can happen. And when you come back, you need to be skeptical because it might not all have been exactly the way it looked or sounded. You may have several things going on there in your data stream that uh, aren't obvious to you. But we have this idea that when we go from this virtual reality, another virtual reality, that other virtual reality is going to work just like this one. You know, if we see a light in the sky, then that's because, damn it, there was a big light in that sky. And I don't know why those other people couldn't see it. You know, they must have been lying. They really saw it and just told me they didn't because, you know, it's a conspiracy. You know, we have these kinds of issues. Whereas if you don't, you know, if, if you don't, uh, if you understand that reality is virtual and all kinds of strange things can happen, then you can be more open-minded, but you also have to be skeptical. If you say, oh, that bright light in the sky, that was a flying saucer. A little green man must be up there from the you know, backside of the moon or something. Well, that's not necessarily true. It may have just been a light in the sky stuck into your data stream just to give you an opportunity to see whether you could handle it with open-minded skepticism or whether you'd run off looking for you know, you know, people on the dark side of the moon and get carried away within your ego. would go berserk with the information. Hard to say. See, there's lots of reasons and it has to depend. It depends on you and what you need, what kind of lessons are be just right for you now, today, and tomorrow you're a different person, perhaps. So that's why you always remain skeptical of whatever happens, whatever data you get. And you find out it's not only good advice when you're talking about non-physical reality, in other words, other virtual realities other than this one, 
it's good advice in this reality too. See, just always be skeptical of everything you get and say, well, I got that, but I really don't know what that means or where that came from. All right, live gracefully with uncertainty. Just set that aside and let it be a mystery. Don't feel like you have to come up with a belief that answers the mystery. Just let it remain a mystery. Learn to live gracefully with uncertainty. And you may have a whole lot of mysteries in your life, and maybe someday you'll get information that will help you fix them, or I mean answer them. But meanwhile, just let them be mysteries. Let them be skeptical. They don't have to be, you know, Martians in a spaceship with green pointy ears. It could just be a light in the sky. No idea where that light came from, but well, you know, I go on with my life, you see. You don't have to get too excited about it to where you have to come to beliefs one way or another. Just let it be a mystery. Okay. Tom, that uh, raised the question for me a little bit about sources of information. Um, there was a discussion the other day about that. Negative and positive information can be mixed in, and you have to sort it out. If it comes from a loving place, if it's coming from love, it would you would trust that that information. But not sometimes some negative in, information can s sneak into whatever it is you're receiving. Um, to me, the source of information is is very important. You've well, often said, "Well, it doesn't, you know, really matter." What do you think? What do you think well, about that? All the information you get, you should be uh, skeptical about it, because there are many ways to get information into your data stream, and you know, it's it's not like there's just one way. There's lots of different ways. For instance, uh, here's an example I use sometimes. The uh, we had some of the early remote viewers who got very, very good at remote viewing and were so good at it that they were always right. They were in the 95, you know, 98% uh, probability of getting it right sort of thing. And they were getting a bit full of themselves and the public was getting more knowledgeable of their existence, which was pushing the sci uncertainty principle a little bit hard. And they were getting very cocky with their abilities and always being right. So they got some misinformation. You know, the system showed them things that just weren't true. Now, not just any little thing, not when they were remote viewing, you know, what was behind the locked door, but when they were on the stand with all the cameras in front of them and, and you know, this was going to be a real big deal and everybody could see it and they go, guess what I saw last night, you know, and they deliver this message and all that was bogus. So, you know, that was just a little takedown by the system that says, you know, we need to, we need to cool this off a little bit because the science certainty principle is being squeezed a little too tight and your ego is growing a little too big. So that would be a, an, a, a, a situation where the larger conscious system provides misinformation on purpose. But it was with good intent, you see. The intent was to make the whole situation better. It was it, the situation was getting worse. It was kind of it was sort of unraveling there, and it, and it wanted to make it better. So the larger system always has a positive intent with what it gives you, but sometimes what you need is a good you know wrap between the eyes to get your attention, and sometimes the system will give you that. So it, just because it's a loving system doesn't mean it's always going to pull you up on its lap and, you know, whisper sweet nothings in your ear and tell you how amazing and wonderful you are and, you know, and treat you like a little child. Sometimes what you need is a good slap. Sometimes what you need is encouragement. And sometimes what you need is some misinformation in order to get you to realize that, you know, you, uh, you have to think for yourself. That's another situation where, where the system will give information. Sometimes people um get good at getting information from the system and pretty soon they rely on it they can't make a decision without getting inside information you know they can't go out the door of their house and interact with the world until they check their horoscope until they you know uh talk to their guides until they do this you know everybody they meet they get their guides to tell them whether it's a good person or a not a good person you see they they start to live their life based on this information they're getting. And what happens then is they get some 
wrong information. They get information that leads them to the edge of a cliff and tells them to jump or something. And then they have to realize, oh, I can't really trust this. I'm going to have to think for myself. You say, well, mission accomplished then. You say, so that's another reason why some people will get misinformation. So you have to look at the information you get and be skeptical of it and think, ask this kind of question. What can I learn from this information? What is there in here that I can use? Not who said it and can I trust it? Can I believe it? What can I do with this information? Oh, I see this piece of information was a test. They wanted to know if I jump off a cliff. No, I'm not gonna do that. You know, that would be a dumb thing to do. This information is, uh, I can't tell. Well, just set it over here and I'll be skeptical about that for a while. I don't act on any of that because I don't know what that is. So you have to live your own life based on your own decisions out of your own quality. Otherwise, you're no longer evolving. You're just a puppet that somebody else is telling you what to do. You see, you've now defeated the purpose of being here. So you be, you know, be skeptical. It's not just that that, source out there is the source. It's pure love and it's always right and true and never do anything to give me misinformation or lead me astray. Well, it depends on you. Maybe you need to be led astray sometimes for your own good. And also, don't be thinking that the larger conscious system is the big mama, you know, trying to uh, raise everybody uh, individually. It's not like that either. You have to draw some attention first because of what you're doing. You have to be open and willing to grow before you get much attention. Uh, it has to be something that you can handle and learn from. It's not, you know, mama consciousness is, is uh, you know, coaching you every step of the way. You're expected to go on your own steam. Sometimes little corrections are needed. Sometimes you happen to have enough attention that you get that correction and other times you don't. You just keep on digging, digging that hole deeper uh, or you don't pay attention to the corrections that are given. Anyway, it's a, it's, a, it's a game that has lots of different sources of input, including our own. See, we have our own imagination and our imagination could see that light in the sky. Well, was it your imagination? Was it the system trying to... Uh, you know, open your eyes to a bigger reality? Or was it just a, a, a neuron flash someplace in your optical system that you interpreted as a light in the sky? Well, all of the above could be true. Be skeptical. Don't jump to conclusions. Go ahead and live your life, make your own decisions and see what happens. See, it's, that's kind of the right, the right attitude. All right, Tom, uh, even though you answered this question generally this next question is from Justin um, each individual experience is unique so you may have a particular insight uh, for this next question and Justin asks a few months back I had an out-of-body experience in which I called out to Uncle Tom for assistance haven't we all when I did an oversized butterfly appeared in the darkness and landed on my shoulder. I asked if it was one of the beings that comes when people call for Uncle Tom. It nodded yes. Then it motioned to me to communicate non-verbally. I said I would try. However, suddenly the butterfly said it was very tired and needed to lay down on the ground. When I questioned the need for sleep in MPMR, it said it hadn't slept in two days and needed rest. The butterfly began to take on the appearance of a baby and then drifted off to sleep. This is a fairly typical example of my sporadic and mostly spontaneous experiences in MPMR. How does one go about deciphering these types of experiences into useful and applicable information? Are these types of experiences often designed to be evasive, cryptic, and vague? Um, I have found that. Or is it more likely that I am unintentionally distorting the information? And what could you answer, Justin, that would apply, you know, specifically to him? Okay. Um, it's probably not, Justin, that you're distorting the information because you have a lot of experience uh, bumping around in the non-physical. And with that experience, you tend to learn not to distort information. So I doubt that that's not the case. Now, why you've got the big butterfly and uh, 
that it happened that way, then the big butterfly, while it gets your attention and becomes someone you possibly could have this conversation or ask your questions to, then suddenly it declines to do any of that, which was the reason that it came in the first place and decides to go to sleep instead. In other words, it's, um, <laughs> it's just not cooperating at all. You see, the system's just giving you junk. Well, it could be several reasons that that might happen. One would be when you ask for assistance. Okay, so you call Uncle Tom for assistance, and it could very well be that the system listened to that call and said, this guy doesn't need assistance. He needs to just, you know, go on and do it and make his decision and, and uh, you know, take charge and, and move on. He really doesn't need any help here or whatever. And in a way of telling you that, you get the big butterfly that then decides to go to sleep. So you get, you get fluff and nonsense because what they're saying is you don't need the help. Figure it out yourself and go on. You know, you're, you're, you're relying here on help where you, you need to, you've got what it takes. You've got the answer in there, you know, go use it. So that could be one reason. I'm just making things up. You know, I don't know what you, what you, uh, you know, ask for help for, but that's a possibility that it was just telling you that you don't need this help. And it was doing that just with a, a sense of humor, I guess big butterfly, you know, the, oh yeah, I'm a butterfly. Let's, we have to communicate telepathically, but not now. I'm going to take a nap. You know, that's, uh, that's good humor from the larger consciousness system. <laughs> you know, there may be other, there may be other reasons with it as well. It could be. And a lot of people, when they are, you know, when you're, when you're dealing in the non-physical, you deal with it mostly from the being level. It's you at the being level that's doing this. But if you have a part of your awareness is still connected to the intellectual level, then the intellectual level can bring in little episodes like that because it questions. Because now there's a different scenario now than what I just said. So now you ask Uncle Tom for assistance and immediately, and that's all from the being level, and that's good, except there's a little piece of your intellect that said, oh, I wonder if Uncle Tom's going to show up. And if he shows up, how's he going to do that? And now you're not necessarily doing this intellectually, but your intellect is running these programs. And often your intellect will run that so fast that you don't actually hear the words or, or think the thoughts, but your intellect is just kind of going through that. And it might say, well, I wonder how he's going to show up or what this is going to be like. This might be interesting. And then your mind thinks about, well, it could be something really strange, you know, or a symbol of some sort and then poof, you get a big butterfly, okay? So then it could be your intellect just churning on possibilities and things that might happen, and then it kind of gets interested in this idea of it being something weird, and what would be really weird? Well, a big butterfly would be really weird. So you might be creating that kind of a response in your intellect, and then the reason that it would go nowhere, that this moth would come, or this, excuse me, it wasn't a moth, that was a butterfly, that this butterfly, would come uh, would come along and you know present like yeah let's talk telepathically but not now I want to go to sleep it's because the intellect doesn't really have the content to share you see the intellect's just just buzzing off on a story the way our minds often do you know you know how we daydream and we just have this you know and our minds just zings off and runs through a little a little story and it doesn't necessarily mean anything well that could have happened created the moth got the moth, but because the moth really didn't have anything, your intellect didn't really have anything to tell you. Well, when it came time to talk, it just topped out and, you know, it, uh, you know, it didn't have anything to say. So it decided I'm tired. I'm going to go to sleep now. So it was just your intellect set itself up, got stuck in a situation where it needed, <laughs> it needed to have content, didn't have any. So it, you know, found a way out. So that could be also what's going on, which is there's a little bit of intellectual chatter going in in the background. And you probably have a very creative mind. You're an artist. Artists tend to have very creative minds. And when you have a creative mind, an intellect will do things like big butterflies that then go to sleep and turn into babies because creative minds do that sort of thing. You probably have all Sometimes you just have little vignettes where your mind kind of goes off and does something and you wonder, oh, what was that about? You know, well, those things can happen to you when you're out exploring in the non-physical as well. 
So it's one of those two things. Either the the system's giving you a little a little uh, a little joke, a little uh, oh, don't ask for help. You know, you can do it, or your intellect is just running off a little vignette that uh, is nonsense. And what do you do with that information? You remain skeptical. You don't throw it out. You remain empty. You know, you remain open-minded because one day that might mean something. So you don't just throw it away. You know, one day you're going to be walking through the woods and this big, you know, six foot butterfly is going to land on your shoulder and you go, oh, I remember that. So you don't just toss it out. You, uh, you just keep it there, but you don't, there's nothing you can do with it. No way to process it. So it just, it's one of those odd things that happen. And I've got, I've got a long list of odd things that have happened, you know, that never really turned into anything significant. And it's just the way it is. I think a lot of them is, is the intellect grabbing, making little stories up as it goes. And some of them are, are uh, little slaps on the wrist to, to uh, pay attention or, you know, approach a problem a different way, that kind of thing. So that's my thoughts on it. But again, there's always three or four or more reasons that you may have gotten that. And you say that's typical, which means you get a lot of that. I suspect that would be typical because you ask more help than you need, or it's typical because your intellect usually has a little fragment of it that's still churning away in the background. And though you told that intellect to sit down and shut up, it didn't pay attention. It sat down and crawled over in a corner and is making stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> over in the corner where you don't notice it. That, that makes a lot of sense, Tom. I, I appreciate that. Do you, do you think that, uh, well, I mean, I guess this is pretty obviously true that it's oftentimes a blend of both where the intellect will take the information and kind of add little mm -hmm. doodles to it, basically. And uh, so it's a mixture of both at the same time. Yes, absolutely. And that mixture can, can vary. You know, it can be like 90% one and 10% the other or 100% one and zero the other or 50-50 or that's why I say there's so many different ways that you can get, you know, a particular result. There's lots of different reasons. And I only came up with those two. You know, there's probably a couple other ones that, uh, you know, that I didn't talk about because I didn't think of them. But there's lots of different ways. Yes, combinations, of course. Your intellect may be sitting down there being a good little intellect, not saying anything until it gets a little piece of data that is just sets it off. You know, it could be you just thinking for a moment, well, I wonder how uncle Tom's going to show up. You know, what's this going to be like? And then your intellect sitting down there and then, you know, says, Oh, I know it'll be a big butterfly or a flying pig or, you know, burning bush or, you know, and then your intellect can go off on a little story because you gave it a nudge. Hard to say, but yeah, if you get a lot of that, then just ignore it. It's just, it's just the junk junk on the line you know that's right. that's typical you know you got this data stream and there's just junk in a data stream and you just have to let it go not not throw it away but basically just hold it off there as maybe someday this will make sense maybe never but don't pay much attention to it <laughs>